So just uh, as we're arriving, letting ourselves settle in a very simple way. So where's our contact with the earth? With our breath. Almost as if uh, when we go for a walk and we just sit down with a cup of tea or look at the sunset and there's a natural settling. Just allowing ourselves to arrive here with as much welcome and gentleness and openness, interest as we can. And noticing we don't actually have to do anything, our, our breathing is here, and the support of the earth is here. Our listening is here, we're just learning to remember and attend. to be conscious. A warm welcome to everybody. Mm. It's really lovely to be here and to see you here. And um, just for anybody who's new, um, just to say a little bit about this session. So it will last for an hour and there'll be a time for uh, some chanting and some guided meditation and then uh, some Dharma reflections. And this is the second week of, um, <clears throat> it's the second week where I've been teaching. So I'm Sumeda, one of the SMS core teachers. And um, it's, so this is the second week in uh, a contemplation of body. So I'll be saying some things that follow on from last week, but which can also be taken uh, discreetly as well. So and the recording from last week is available um, if anybody's interested. So, um, yeah, so let's start with some chanting. I'll share screen. Um, Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, wonderful. <clears throat> so, and uh, I unfortunately don't have the link to the chanting book and 
Michael isn't here this week to help with that. So I, hopefully you can all follow it on screen or have the link yourselves to the chanting book. Um, <clears throat> and we'll start um, with the uh, Namo Tassa, the homage to the Buddha, um, which also has this really lovely sense that many of you know of like returning, returning our heart, returning our life to that which is awake. And then we can uh, chant the refuges together and also the precepts. And then we'll do uh, also some of the other chants that I'll let you know as we go on to them. So chanting is a really beautiful way of uh, bringing our body, our heart, our mind together in the um, contemplation of uh, these beautiful teachings and the capacity we have for awakeness in our being here. So um, it's really lovely to approach them in that way. Um, and if chanting is new to you, then you're welcome to just try it or also um, listen, whatever feels comfortable for you. <clears throat> Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Sarnanga Chami Dhammang Sarnanga Chami Sanghang Sarnanga Chami Dutyam Pi Buddhang Sarnanga Chami Dutyam Pidamang Sarananga Chami Dutyam Pisangang Sarananga Chami Tatyam Pibudang Sarananga Chami Tatyam Pidamang Sarananga Chami Tatiam pi sangang sarananga chami Panatipata vera mani sika padang samadhyami I undertake the training to refrain from intentionally taking life Adina dana vera mani sika padang samadhyami I undertake the training to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumicha chara vera mani sika padang samadhyami. I undertake the training to refrain from misuse of sexuality and the senses. Musawada vera mani sika padang samadhyami. I undertake the training to refrain from speech that is false, divisive, harsh and meaningless. Sura miraya majapamadatana vera mani sika padang samadhyami. I undertake the training to refrain from intoxication which leads to carelessness. And then we can uh, chant the recollection of the Triple Jewel. So this is the qualities of the Buddha Dharma Sangha. <clears throat> Which is really nice to also, when you have time outside the session, to read the English and to contemplate how what these might actually mean for you in your experience. <clears throat> Iti piso bagawa arahang samma sambuto vija charana sampano sugato lokawidu anutaro 
Purisa Dhamma Sarachi Sata Deva Manusanam Bhutto Bhagavati Sawakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditi Ko Akani Ko Ehi Pasi Ko Opanai Ko Pachatang Veditabo Winyu Hiti Supatipano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Ujupatipano Bhagavato Sawato sawaka sango nyaya patipano bhagavato sawaka sango samichi patipano bhagavato sawaka sango yajidam chatari purisa yuganiya tapurisa pugala esa Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Ahune Yo Ahune Yo Dakine Yo Anjali Karani Yo Anutaran Punya Ketam Lokasati And then I thought we could chant the highest blessings, so the Mangala Sutta, um, <clears throat> which is just on the next page. Thus have I heard that the Blessed One was staying at Sawati, Residing at the Jetta's Grove, in an Artapindicus Park, then in the dark of the night, a radiant Deva illuminated all Jetta's Grove. She bowed down low before the Blessed One, then standing to one side, she said, Devas are concerned for happiness and ever long for peace. The same is true for humankind. What then are the highest blessings? Avoiding those of foolish ways, associating with the wise, and honouring those worthy of honour. These are the highest blessings. Living in places of suitable kinds, with the fruits of past good deeds, and guided by the rightful way, these are the highest blessings. Accomplished in learning and craftsman skills, with discipline highly trained, and speech that is true and pleasant to hear. These are the highest blessings. Providing for mother and father's support, and cherishing family, and ways of work that harm no being. These are the highest blessings. Giving with Dharma in the heart, offering help to relatives and kin, and acting in ways that leave no blame. These are the highest blessings. Steadfast in restraint and shunning evil ways, avoiding intoxicants that dull the mind, and mindfulness in all things that arise. These are the highest blessings. Respectfulness and of humble ways, contentment and gratitude, and hearing the Dhamma frequently taught, these are the highest blessings. Patience and willingness to accept one's faults, seeing venerated seekers of the truth, and sharing often the words of Dhamma. These are the highest blessings. 
The holy life lived with ardent effort, seeing for oneself the noble truths and the realization of Nibbana. These are the highest blessings. Although involved in worldly ways, unshaken the mind remains, and beyond all sorrows spotless secure, these are the highest blessings. Those who live by following this path, no victory wherever they go, and every place for them is safe. These are the highest blessings. And then we can finish with the um, Tara mantra. <clears throat> so homage to Tara, compassion expressed as enlightened activity. So this is a really beautiful uh, energy to invoke and to contemplate how that comes through our heart. <clears throat> Om Tari Tu Tari Tu Re Soham 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 Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Soham Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Soham Om Tare Tu Tare Tu So letting the energy, the vibrations, or the words of those chants uh, touch our being and also allowing our intention um, for joining today, allowing that to come into and nourish our heart. Just feeling how it is to arrive here. This body, this mind, this heart. It's 
Seeing if we can allow the weight of our body to invite our mind, our attention to, to gather, to come into the body. And to notice where there is the contact with the earth. So I really like this image of we're almost like we're a water drop and we're settling down naturally towards the earth. In the contemplation of body, in the first foundation of mindfulness, there's the teaching on the elements, which is one that I really love. So as we notice the touch of the earth underneath us, Noticing the stability, almost this element of that which is slightly solid. Feel that underneath our body. Recollecting how the Earth grows so many things, plants and flowers and trees and all so many beings, visible, invisible. And then noticing the earth element, which is one way of saying it, the earth element within us, what is solid within us, what is nourished by the earth within us, our bones, our, our teeth. Our fingernails, these are all things that are more evidently solid. The earth element outside, earth element inside. Now we're nourished by food. And if we really contemplate this deeply, where is the separation? Are we really so separate? Can we sense in our being that which belongs to the earth? Which is somehow incredibly alive within our being. We're connected. Or water element water outside in the rivers, in the seas, in the rain, in the damp in the air. And our water inside, we're made of a lot of water. And we feel that which is cohesive, which is holding together our flesh, 
all the blood as it's pulsing around our being. More the moisture in the mouth or the eyes. And contemplation is water outside, water inside. Are we really so separate? And how do we honor our connectedness? Or the warmth of our being? One way of framing this up is this fire element, the warmth in us which digests that we need to regulate, we need a we have quite a small range of comfortable temperature, livable temperature. Noticing this element inside and outside. The sun, source of heat or cool. Notice how sensitive we are to temperature. How much we need these forces which digest, even sometimes the fire element is said to relate to aging, as we're kind of slowly um, kind of cooking and wrinkling. Are we really so different? More independent. And then air element. Noticing the air element outside. This invisible nourishment. that which vibrates the wind as it moves. And then very directly with an in-breath, we notice the air element inside. It comes into our lungs, into our cells, to the vibration of our body. We contemplate this deeply, it's a very, very powerful and immediate bridge. To sensing deeply our interconnectedness. Both our dependence and how nourished we are each moment. What do we wish to give back? Into this life that we're so woven through. Do we need to follow the illusion of our separateness? Can we follow what the sense of deep connection and reverence offers? 
through our through listening into our embodied experience. We can end the meditation now. <clears throat> So that's just a very small dipping into um, one of the practices that is mentioned in the first foundation of mindfulness. But this is a practice um, that I'll say a little bit more about um, and, um, and which can be very, very powerful in transforming our sense of who and what we are also. So it can be a very deep path to both uh, the compassion that comes through connectedness and insight. So <clears throat> I will say a bit more about it, but um, mm. so yeah, I want to say a little more about uh, uh, for me, the importance of body contemplation and ways into embodied practice that I find to be helpful. And I wanted to start with a, a quote from many of you know by now, one of my favorite um, poet philosophers, John O'Donoghue. <clears throat> so he's Irish and there's something lovely about the Celtic uh, and um, way into understanding spirituality where there's a lot of connection with nature. There's a lot of sense of connection with nature. And I grew up in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland where the nature is pretty, it's like wild and raw. It's like there's no trees, there's lots of sea, there's lots of hard rock because otherwise the islands wouldn't exist there. They'd, be, they'd have been eaten already. And, um, <clears throat> and I read something by John O'Donoghue that said there's something about growing up in a landscape where you sense that nature is uh, alive, you know, where you really sense it. Um, that really resonated with me. So anyway, this is a quote from John O'Donoghue. So he says, there's a beautiful complexity of growth within the human soul. In order to glimpse this, it's helpful to visualize the mind as a tower of windows. Many people remain trapped at one window, looking out every day at the same scene in the same way. Real growth is experienced when you draw back from that one window, turn and walk around the inner tower of the soul and see all the different windows that await your gaze. Through these different windows, you can see new vistas of possibility, presence and creativity. Complacency, habit and blindness often prevent you from feeling your life. So much depends on the frame of vision. The window through which you look. So this for me links um, to the sense of insight that we can have as like different ways of looking into our experience and there are some ways that maybe we confine ourselves with it, and there are some ways that through getting to explore them we can realize they help to liberate uh, our experience and our heart from maybe um, habits that limit us or ways in which we cause harm, ways in which we bind ourselves. <clears throat> and so um, contemplating the body and looking into our bodily experience deeply for me is one of these ways of starting to look around our experience and maybe look through a different window, find a different gaze. And the elements practice, say, contemplating body in that way is definitely a way of how is it if we look in this way? So, um, and just a reminder of the power of uh, coming into our body as a way of practice that is actually said in the early teachings. Um, as I mentioned last week, that mindfulness immersed in the body is one of the ways to the ultimate, so to reaching liberation. And this can be 
<clears throat> it can seem kind of paradoxical because when we come to spiritual practice, we're often like, oh, you know, we have this vulnerable, vulnerable body, our human experience is messy, and how do we get out of it? Or how do we, um, yeah, there can be a sense of wanting to get out of it. And actually, the, the invitation is to get it, get to know it more deeply in this way of looking in different ways. And so understanding how we can find a place and a way of liberation, like right here, with this body, with these senses, which I find to be a very, very, very beautiful invitation. <clears throat> And actually, um, in our embodied experience, so we have this short lifespan, um, there is the sense of it being a precious opportunity. So there's a turnaround invited in the Buddhist teachings where we're invited to look at our vulnerability, look at our aging, look at our, our that we will die. That's the only certainty that we have. You know, when we're born, the only certainty we have is that we're going to die. And yet we turn away from that. And there's something very profound in the Buddhist teaching that is ask, asking us to enter and to see our life profoundly, to enter our life profoundly. How do we hold our transiency in a way that um, we are not creating suffering? So I find this to be uh, very, very profound. <clears throat> and so in the first foundation of mindfulness, there are all these different propositions of how we can look into our experience. And I mentioned those last week. So just to say briefly, we there's an invitation to come to the breath, to notice the postures of the body, uh, to come into a sense of mindfulness with clear comprehension where we are which is a very simple invitation, actually. How is it to stand? How is it to fit? How is it to lie? It's even listed, apparently, how to urinate. How is it when we urinate, you know? It's like it's like all the details of our experience <laughs> we're being asked to come into, you know? Um, and a modern day society doesn't like this so much, you know? It's like we don't talk about that. But the Buddha's invitation is to, you know, like be clearly aware in in all the flow of our experience <clears throat> there's the contemplation also on one word is loathsomeness and or compoundedness of our existence uh, and that's i mentioned last week that's the mm, mm, contemplating you know that we are compounded we're made of water we're made of there's all these different parts blood phlegm bile da, 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 da. and that can that's a, a contemplation that was particularly recommended if your mind is like like very filled with desire then it's like a balancing meditation um the elements practice and then contemplation of death so these are all quite um they're quite rigorous possibilities of re-looking into our existence and in terms of so I, I talked about that, those last week and then this week I wanted to say a little bit more about for me developing an embodied practice so some of the benefits and ways of doing this so one thing that embodied practice offers to me is that it invites uh, a gathering of our being So often, um, as you may have noticed, as we're getting about our daily business, we're quite split. So like our thoughts are running off here and our emotions are here and our bodies somewhere else. And we're kind of very divided in some way or very loosely connected. And some parts are going faster and some parts are like left behind. Like I mentioned last week, I'm always leaving my cup somewhere it's like and it's it's like my mind's gone off somewhere else and my body's left my cup you know on the terrace or and I'm like where's my cup and uh <clears throat> and so that's a really silly example but it's true where I notice that my mind is often very separate or it's gone off quicker than my body and with um say the contemplation of breath or contemplation of some of the elements or contemplation of posture, 
or clearly comprehending where we are now. There's this invitation of slowing down and coming back into rhythm, um, which is very, very profound. So um, again, John O'Donoghue talks about how we've fallen out of the rhythms of nature. And I don't know if you can resonate with that, that somehow we, in our human realm, we've started to, um, particularly with the advent of internet, but also with machines, with kind of daily pressures, we tend to go quicker and quicker and quicker and we lose touch with our breath. We lose touch with, say, the slowness of the rain or the possibility of doing something in a way that has this, this craftsman skill that the Buddha talks about when we're coming to the breath. He says, notice when your breath is long like a craftsman would notice when he's making a long turn or she would notice when she's making a long turn there's something very different about that way of slowing down and coming into an embodied knowing that just the invitation to come to the breath to notice how our posture is as it is it's inviting us into this different rhythm different way of experiencing our our being different sense of time, maybe different sense of priority. And so it helps to reconfigure our experience. So for me, it's really helped to, helpful to contemplate what helps us to actually land in this way. So for me, I, I've spent a lot of time with the soles of my feet, like spending time feeling the soles of my feet touching the earth. And so when I'm in a situation where my, say my emotions are getting activated or I've gone into like overdrive with my thoughts. It's like, oh, where are the soles of my feet? Which really helps to ground and settle and bring a different anchor to the experience. And so generally the re responsiveness is wiser at that point. And also, as we do that, we notice that we've got a capacity for our attention not to be hijacked. We've got an, a capacity to guide our attention. And we also maybe notice in that moment of pausing, like Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, do these mindfulness spells. The moment of pausing, notice the alive stillness that's there for us. Just as maybe, you know, we take a moment to like put our cup down mindfully or to touch the earth mindfully. It sounds like such a small practice and it's actually really, really radical because it, it stops us from getting carried off in the forces of, you know, kind of greed, hatred and delusion. And apparently even Maha Kasapa, who was one of the most austere disciples of the Buddha, he really also, he, even he said, you know, make time for this, make time to touch the earth, make time to be in nature if we can. Because when we're doing that, our mind comes into a different realm. <clears throat> so there's this different sense of gathering in our being. And then we can also feel into what is balancing for us if we're feeling very averse to our experience. Where is it that we might feel some safety or some well-being or some pleasantness in our body? You know, so for me, if I'm very activated, sometimes taking a warm shower helps my body to soothe, helps my experience to soothe, helps there to be, a, again, a sense of perspective. Or say, you know, I mentioned the, the meditation on one word is loathsomeness or the compounded nature of the body, that if you're really getting carried off in like, you know, desire here, there and everywhere, it can be helpful to contemplate the compounded nature of this existence. Am I just going after something again? You know, what's that desire like? So we, we learn to balance with these kind of contemplations as well. And this, this, this has a kind of care to it. Um, so it's a very applied practice. So we're inviting ourselves into a gathering in our being. And as we're doing that with our body, we also are uh, coming into a different way of knowing. So as you'll have noticed, our mind, our thinking mind can, can really make clear concepts. It can really um, 
you know, it can think it's really understood something because there's a conceptual knowing of it. And our body's knowing of something is very, very different. It take, can take us to a level of understanding in our experience that is very different from the conceptual. Um, so this, I mean, it helps us come into a more connected way of knowing, uh, a less grasping way of knowing also. And also um, more connected. So for me, as I come into my body and I recognize its connectedness with the elements or I recognize that uh, there's a vulnerability here in this embodiment, there tends to be this resonance with, uh, with the earth that I'm part of or with other beings who may be suffering. Um, so it helps us to know things in a very, very different way and maybe respond from a deeper, more connect connected place in ourselves. And there's a there's a capacity for continuity in this as well. So, you know, the the classically we see meditation as maybe sitting on our cushion, but that's just one posture that we can clearly know. Okay, so sitting. And the word for clearly knowing in the in the sutta, uh, the first foundation of mindfulness is sampajanya, which has uh, a lot of useful um, implications, and I'll put it in the references. Uh, but one of the one of the things that sampajanya, which is clear comprehension, helps us to reflect on, is as I am I adding to delusion here? Am I adding to ways that cause harm? So as we come into our body, say with the simplicity, feel the soles of the feet, feel the body sitting, or feel the body walking, or feel the body as we're making tea, uh, or as we're doing yoga. There's a simplicity in that, which is really beautiful. And there's also a, a clear comprehension. Is this something useful? Is it something that's helping my practice? Is there, are there ways in which I'm causing harm here? So there's the slowing down, the simplicity, and what's happening here? So this is really, really helpful. And it's in our life, because all of our, as much as our bodies are all elements, each one of us is also individual. So it's a real invitation to authenticity. <clears throat> And then the third thing I wanted to mention as uh, something useful to practice with and that comes through embodied practice is the way that it, um, it both simplifies and refreshes our vision. So as we contemplate the elements, say, it's like we can really break the bubble of our isolation. So, uh, you know, it's like it can sound theoretical, but, you know, like when you drink a cup of water, if you just take the time to notice, this is a body practice, take the time to notice the water coming into your body, take the time to appreciate that nourishment. And, or the air. So this radically changes our sense of who and what we are. There's a lovely quote quote by somebody who I think is called Arna Nyes, I don't know how to say it, who is Norwegian, who was part of the deep ecology movement. And he's like, well, if we take our body to be just this individual little entity, that's going to give us one perspective on our experience and how we act. And if we take it to be, uh, if we take like world as self, if we take our body as a deeply interdependent being, if we start to understand that, say, through elements practice, that radically alters our perspective, our sense of who and what we are, how we wish to engage, what we may wish to support or not support, uh, and also the support that we receive. You know, so when we're feeling isolated, if we notice the earth, the water, the air, we're supported or when we're feeling um, when we're feeling distressed and maybe we just want to distract ourselves 
maybe our choices will be different you know we're not going to do something that's harmful to ourselves or to the the earth that we're part of just to distract ourselves if we recognize that interconnectedness or like one of my favorite not favorite because it's very sad actually but the one of the examples that i have found really has moved me is like you know that our society so doesn't like aging that we have all these anti-aging possibilities and tr- creams you know surgeries and creams and 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 all of that and actually in in some of the creams that are made you know there's animal tissue and there's sometimes fecal tissue in these creams that because the the cells regenerate quicker and so we're putting this on you know to and this isn't a criticism of it's not to criticize that but just to say sometimes we for me if that if i recognize that i'm doing that then I feel there's a certain way in which I'm maybe not treating life with the respect that I would wish to treat it. And I'm also going against a natural process. So which is more harmful, like the the simple process of aging or everything we do around that to deny it? So we start to maybe look at life differently, make different choices, not from a place of criticism, but from a place of connectedness. Uh, which can really help us. Mm. And Catherine McGee, who um, is a UK teacher, she talks about the elements as lenses which restore us to that which is sacred. And uh, uh, and a kind of multi-leveled way of being in this world that has meaning again. So, and she says, our current global crisis has been called a crisis of meaning where we're just like we're using material forms as something we have to keep or exploit and so how does this change when we start to experience the dependency and the aliveness of our being which comes through our body so then this can bring gratitude and we can practice that daily we can as we eat our food we can have a practice of gratitude with a blessing or just with the way our heart is inclining um We can contemplate the mutuality of our practice. We're not alone. So as we may feel alone with our griefs or our worries or our concerns, as we come into an embodied experience, we realize we're not alone. So there's a a lovely poem in in one translation of the early poems of the Buddhist nuns, the Enlightenment poems, where one of the nuns has... um, She's recounting the experience where she lost her daughter, lost her daughter. And she's roaming through the woods. She's kind of gone mad and she's roaming through the woods, you know, and she's calling out for her daughter. And uh, and there's a line in the poem that says, so when you're. I, I can't remember exactly how it says it. it's like when you hit those places of desolation, listen for a voice calling back. So as we come into our embodiment, we start to realize we're not alone. And that's both supportive for us and changes our perspective. What do we give in this world? And so this is the last thing I wanted to say about body, really, although this is such a deep subject, is as we touch into these areas of practice, can we allow them to really transform our experience? So, you know, there's the classical model in te- in teachings where it's like we study and we practice and then maybe we realize or the senses the we can know something conceptually, but we kind of we allow this to come into our understanding, the, the understanding that transforms us. As we come into our embodied experience and we taste here the fundamental truths of our transiency our vulnerability and what does that do to our perspective for me it opens into um both a sense of well how do i find support in this transient realm and that comes through the embodiment the elements also the shared vulnerability that we support each can support each other in and also compassion for others within this so Uh, This also can be then an avenue of how do we practice that 
one way is to um, not close down, to to commit ourselves to um, feeling resonance and how do we wish to respond in a way that doesn't support harm. Although, you know, that may be complex, but really listening within. Um, another way is to commit ourselves to, say, to the precepts that we chanted at the beginning and to to practice with them, so not as shoulds, but as um, reflections. How do I deepen here in my actions of body, speech, and mind with this um, listening heart that is embodied and connected? Uh, how do I? How do these precepts reflect through my heart in a way that I um, am bringing that through my actions of body, speech, and mind? <clears throat> so uh, this is part of what I love about the teachings is they're not dogmas, they're invitation. And as we do this, we start to come into our embodiment in uh, a real and loving way. And so that we can receive, uh, say, what is coming through our senses in a way that is nourishing us and that we're not grasping, we're not adding greed, hatred, and delusion. So there can be this experience of wonder here, of nourishment. How do I contribute to this life? Uh, which Joanna Macy talks about as power with in a very beautiful way. So power with as being ways in which we, um, how does she say it? The capacity to act in ways that increase the sum total of one's conscious partic participation in life. So instead of power over my mind dominating my body or my being dominating other beings, how do we have power with? Uh, which for me, this invitation to come back to our body, to the simplicity that we can have here and the connectedness that we can have here and the less grasping way of knowing we can have here is a very powerful doorway. So I, I need to end there, but uh, I hope something in there was helpful. <clears throat> and if not, then you can let it go. Give it back to the earth or the air that it came out of me with. So, <laughs> um, and really thank you for your presence because these things are always, uh, it's a mutual kind of you being here is what also helps come whatever comes out of me so and uh if anybody so the hour session will end now and just to, just before we end actually together i wanted to mention that there are several events coming up by sacred mountain Fanga. so one is on the 31st of the first of march there's return to source with kitty silent Tanisra, which will be a half day retreat um which is really uh, to realign and draw strength from the Bodhisattva heart. Um, so that's on March 31st. And on April 1st, there's an eight-week course starting, the introduction to the Kuan Yin, Kuan Yin Dharmas, which will be really wonderful. And that's with Tanisra and Elaine and uh, Juna. Uh, so I really encourage you to join that. And then April the 3rd, um, there's Adam Stonebreaker, who's starting a class on chanting for healing, insight and liberation. So this is around how we use the timeless practices of chanting and mantras while at the same time really, <clears throat> really deepening the connection with our own inner being. So all of those are wonderful. And I may well be joining some of them. So, uh, and also just to say, if you do wish to offer, oh, I'll put the those events are free are available through the events page which is in the chat and also if you wish to donate to sms also you know all of you know these events are offered on donation um if you wish to donate to support sms and the activities of sms then you can donate via the link so if anybody would like to stay on for 15 minutes we've got 15 minutes to explore or <clears throat> if you have questions or sharings 
you're very welcome. And if you're not, thank you again.